Well, good afternoon. My name is Dominic Angelillo, and welcome to our wrap-up interview on uh, antithrombotic therapy. I have the pleasure of uh, moderating this session with uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Uh, David Cohen, and we have uh, our uh, two uh, guests today, uh, uh, Dr. Davide Capotanno uh, from uh, uh, Catania, Italy, and uh, Professor Han from uh, uh, here from uh, uh, from Seoul. So. Uh, we had a very nice uh, session earlier where we dealt with a number of uh, topics related to antithrombotic therapy. And so I'd like to ask our, our, our guests to kind of a little bit expand uh, on some of these aspects. And we'll start off with the uh, million dollar question of duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. So uh, please provide any insights that you can give to us uh, on what are your thoughts uh, on DAP duration? Uh, as the uh, investigator of a smart choice two trial, I am personally uh, am very much interested in the P2I12 monotherapy uh, after short duration of the DAPT. So, uh, in previous trials, uh, neither uh, prolonged the DAPT nor uh, aspirin monotherapy after short duration DAPT is a satisfactory. The prolonged DAPT increases bleeding risk and aspirin monotherapy increases the risk of MI and stent thrombosis. So that's why we have to another new solution for DAPT. So probably p 12 inhibitor monotherapy after DAPT is a very good option. Balancing ischemic and uh, bleeding risk. Mm -hmm. So a really change in, in, in Concepts. We can see dramatic how in the past uh, in the past two years, uh, where all of a sudden now we're bringing up the topic of P two I twelve inhibitor monotherapy. So, uh, 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 David, you had the opportunity to be the first author on a very very nice review on aspirin free strategies, uh, where uh, the topic of P two I twelve inhibitor monotherapy is largely discussed. Uh, what do you think? Is this something for real? Uh, are our hopes way too high? Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, thank you, Dominic. Uh, first of all, it's a very interesting topic, even uh, semantically, because uh, we always said, okay, shortening the APT means stopping the P2Y12 inhibitor. Now we realize that maybe shortening the APT is to stop aspirin. You can achieve the same uh, effect in uh, reducing bleeding. So uh, what we uh, did was essentially to review where the field is going. And of course, uh, we moved from the largest trial in this uh, field, that maybe the largest trial ever in PCI, which is Global Leaders. With 16,000 uh, patients, uh, they uh, fell short of the primary endpoint, which, which was a, a p value of 0 0.07 for uh, uh, the reduction of a death or a Q wave MI uh, with the uh, aspirin free strategy with ticagrelor monotherapy as compared with the standard of care in ACS and stable CAD patients. So, uh, formally speaking, the trial was uh, negative, so of course, it doesn't support. Uh, Ticagro monotherapy, uh, but uh, then uh, these trials that came from uh, Korea and from uh, Japan once again raised the interest towards this topic because they were positive. Maybe it's just because of the endpoint which was different. It was more towards bleeding while a global leader was more uh, ambitious, was looking at uh, thrombotic uh, endpoints. So I very much look forward to Twilight now because it includes a complex uh, PCI uh, patient population that may derive some uh, benefit also from Tecagor, even in the stable setting. And the primary endpoint is bleeding, which makes a lot of sense to me because when you reduce the intensity of antithrombotic therapy, you expect to bleed uh, uh, of course, less, uh, and uh, I think the design is very well addressed to finally meet the goal of a uh, primary point uh, successfully uh, conducted. And definitely, we all look forward to the results of the of the Twilight study. And uh, Patrick Sirois showed some very interesting uh, uh, analysis from global leaders, which keep the hopes uh, up. I uh, I think that it would be uh, great to see something uh, positive uh, in the field. Uh, David, I know you're the moderator here, but I've got to ask you a question. You know, we spoke about shortening DAP, going back to P2I12 inhibitor monotherapy, 
And now we have a new strategy, which is dual pathway inhibition using a vascular dose of riroxaban. You gave a great presentation. So where does this fit in in all this? Uh, just to make things more complicated, I suppose. I, I mean, I, I do think, you know, as I tried to present uh, at the end of my presentation, there are, you know, we, we, you know what, we, what we don't know, unfortunately, we have, you know, we really don't have good strategies with, with aspirin removal in the very, very long term. Uh, but we have three strategies that have been tried for improving outcomes in patients with stable vascular disease, um, you know, beyond a year after their ACS, um, after the, the dust has settled. Um, clopidogrel plus low-dose aspirin, uh, ticagrelor plus low-dose aspirin, or rivaroxaban plus low-dose aspirin. Um, all three have shown reductions in ischemia. All three have shown benefit um, on, uh, you know, cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke in some combination. Um, but uh, only, you know, only one of those three, um, and they've all shown increased risk of bleeding when you double up the anticoagulants. Um, but only one of the three has shown a reduction in mortality, both cardiovascular and all-cause, which is the low-dose rivaroxaban strategy. Uh, 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 for that, um, you know, really suggesting that that's, you know, probably optimal if you're going to be giving low-dose, you know, low-dose aspirin. Can we, you know, achieve the same thing without the low-dose aspirin? Um, it's hard to know. There was a five milligram dose of, of rivaroxaban alone in that trial, which didn't look nearly as good um, as the two. So, I mean, I think, I mean, there, you know, still is going to be a lot to be, you know, a lot to be sorted out. But I do think for patients, especially you know, in my practice, patients who have multi, you know, multiple vascular disease beds. We know that as you stack up, you know, coronary disease, peripheral artery disease, cerebrovascular disease, the three basic beds that we think about. From the REACH trial, you know, a long time ago, uh, the risk of events goes up, you know, multiplicatively as you add in vascular beds. And so I think that once you have coronary disease plus, peripheral artery disease, coronary disease plus, history of stroke or TIA, I, I think at that point, uh, the addition of low-dose rivaroxaban makes good sense. Those are patients who are just a very high-risk group and deserve, um, you know, everything we can throw at them. Great, great. In, in my opinion, the optimal anti-thrombotic regimen may differ according to timing after the index procedure. So, uh, after immediate, uh, immediately after the PCI, uh, probably DAPT uh, seems to be essential. But after short duration of DAPT, uh, I prefer P trial 12 inhibitor up to one year, mm -hmm. and uh, there is no data. But I th uh, th think uh, the P trial 12 inhibitor monotherapy and aspirin uh, may shows no difference uh, after one year after the index procedure. And uh, as Dr. Cohen uh, mentioned, uh, in high risk patients like compass like patients, dual pathway inhibition may be beneficial. So when you say short DAPT, um, is that a one month, month? Is one that, or, or three it, months? It, it depends, but one or three months. In Smart Choice trial, we uh, prescribed with three months DAPT, and then stopped at two trial. They gave patients only one month DAPT. But I, uh, what I mean uh, as uh, short DAPT uh, is less than three months. So certainly less than, less than three months. Do you worry when you stop? I mean, again, in Asia, we know that the prevalence of, you know, I mean, there's 20, 25% of patients are clopidogrel non-responders. Um, and that's the most common P2Y12 that's being used. So do you worry about, st I mean, so then th those patients are essentially on nothing at that yeah, point. Yeah, that's a very good comment. Uh, probably uh, immediately left after the procedure, one or three months, uh, aspirin uh, seems to, uh, to have a role right. uh, in especially East Asian patients. But, after three months, I think a clopidogrel uh, only uh, may work. So uh, actually, now we are uh, analyzing the data according to the uh, PR, PRU. Okay. So. To see, I mean, it's, do you, I mean, does that worry you, Dominic? You it, spend it, your life testing. Yeah, it, it definitely, it definitely does concern me. And uh, but when you look at uh, uh, the data coming from uh, uh, coming from Asia, with most of the data of patients on clopidogrel. Uh, the ischemic event rates are in, in general lower. It'd be really nice, and I'm glad to hear you having some analysis with the PRU, but it'd be even more interesting if uh, these patients would have had uh, their genetic testing done uh, at, the, at the beginning. Did, in any of your trials, did you do genetic testing? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we uh, couldn't uh, do uh, genetic testing, but uh, we uh, allowed three types of P-trial inhibitors, so 
we will have an opportunity to compare uh, Prasquel or ticagrelin monotherapy versus clopidogrel monotherapy. And it does, I mean, again, I also still worry a little bit about, I mean, again, I, you know, in ACS, you know, we're used to using ticagrelor. It's a, you know, it's a great drug in, you know, in, in, in the ACS setting. Um, but, to cap, I mean, I just, again, worry outside of the clinical trial setting, how long can people remember to take a twice daily drug? I can barely remember to take my once a day drugs <laughs> um, in the morning. And I finally, like, literally last month bought one of those little pill things that counts every, every day, and I finally stopped forgetting, to, you know, because I would, every, after brushing my teeth, I, I couldn't remember yeah. if I'd taken my drugs or not. I was well, like, well, <laughs> well as, as you know, within the uh, ACCHA guidelines, uh, it's really written in a small print below the table, uh, that you know, be cautious of patients with issues of compliance Me, when yeah. when dealing with the <laughs> catalog. Uh, but I guess you know. Um, Again, it worries patients. me mostly in, in monotherapy. I mean, it worries me. We we know it's fine with aspirin, you know, underlying it because aspirin has such a long, you know, it's an irreversible inhibitor. Absolutely. It's there for you know for days and days and days. So you've got some backup. But, Absolutely. You know. <laughs> be interesting. You know, a lot of the studies so far have been done, are being done with tacagalor. Uh, we're forgetting a lot about uh, Prasugro, you know, very, a lot of nice data with, with Prasugro, it's a one steady drug, it's a great drug in PCI in my opinion, it's and it's gone PCI. generic, yeah. at least in our practice now since it's gone generic, we've been using a little bit more Prasugro because patients can have access, you know, easier access to it. So, but uh, no, your points are well, well taken, but the concept of P2Y12 inhibitor monotherapy uh, is something that I actually uh, endorse because uh, we know that it is a key signaling pathway. It has effects not just on activation but amplification. And this is the reason why we're seeing these encouraging results uh, from, uh, from all these studies. Now, it is true uh, that we've been able to do these studies also thanks to better stent designs. We typically don't speak about it, but the truth is we're being able to be less aggressive with our antithrombotics not seeing this increase in thrombotic complication thanks to our better stats. Right, exactly. So it's, I mean, that is, a, you know, you're right. Is, I mean, the, a lot of the foundational th trials were done on the backbone of, you know, first-generation drug-eluting stents, and they probably don't apply so much uh, anymore. Absolutely. So we should switch gears and talk about AFib? Absolutely. The, Absolutely. Uh, the other, you know, gorilla in the, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, 20,000-pound 20, gorilla in the room um, is AFib, which we know is, a, you know, a, again, uh, in the U.S., it's about 7-8% of all PCI patients have uh, atrial fibrillation uh, at that time. Uh, there, you know, it, it's, it's been a problem for a long time of how to manage that, and David, you gave a, a wonderful uh, overview of, of the number of trials. So how do you put together the AFib story in 2019? Well, well, you know, uh, for many years we have said, okay, there are no data, so we don't know whether dual antithrombotic therapy is better uh, than uh, triple antithrombotic therapy. We cannot say this anymore because uh, there are at least uh, three trials performed in the era of NOAC. Uh, altogether, they encompass uh, around 8,000 patients randomized. So with the next one uh, on Edoxaban, we will have uh, around 10,000 patients. So it's a lot. As a class effect, we have a signal that uh, dual antithrombotic therapy makes you uh, bleed less, which makes sense is uh, biologically plausible etc and even the question regarding uh, the thrombotic protection which is the typical concern okay uh, I cannot go dual especially in Europe we have this kind of uh, mindset because we don't know whether this would be uh, enough protective but uh, none of the trial has a signal let's say that uh, there is a doubling of events uh, in terms of thrombosis uh, we can discuss that some uh, lower doses of drugs uh, uh, have some uh, numerical increase in uh, stent thrombosis, myocardial infarction, but still the rates are very low anyway, even in this context. So I think in Europe now we have to be brave as uh, <laughs> the American colleagues that have already endorsed the concept of dual antithrombotic therapy as the default approach with personalization. So it means that uh, if you feel that uh, you have a patient high risk for thrombosis, then you add aspirin for the short term and that's it. But in Europe so far we have done the opposite. So we, uh, we went uh, triple therapy by default 
fault, and then we select the patients for dual therapy. Probably we have to do the other way around, start with the safer approach, because this is uh, the state of the art now of the evidence basis, and then select patients that may benefit from uh, some more aspirin. I must say that uh, in the Augustus trial, the fact that uh, they randomized patients at uh, one week in, uh, on average uh, after the ACS or a PCI still make uh, many of us reluctant on uh, stopping aspirin at the very beginning because they achieve very nice results uh, on top of at least uh, one week of aspirin, I would say. So I, I don't so know. One week of aspirin sounds, I mean, I th that's kind of my take home from Augustus. Maybe it's a was, good balance. You know, I mean, a week. You know, everybody can take a week of aspirin, or almost anybody can take exactly. a week everyone, of aspirin. Exactly, uh, everyone feels relief, including the doctors that are still uh, very hesitant to, to remove right. one and, and, a, and a week of aspirin between, you know, the irreversible effect, that almost lasts two weeks with some meaningful exactly. antipolitic effect, I think. Exactly. So. Absolutely, so absolutely. It's not, it's not a bad compromise there. It's a good there. compromise. I guess my, my question is, why didn't, I mean, I, you know, Augustus was so nice of a trial um, with the, the, the uh, factorial design, randomization. Why do you think the other companies, the other trials didn't, didn't do that. It was just, it was so much more definitive, so much more <laughs> reassuring than these trials where, you know, there, and again, I mean, you showed the, you know, the data on, uh, you know, Pioneer, and that's my friend Mike Gibson ran that trial, but it's like the most complicated trial ever. Maybe mm -hmm. the only more complicated trials are all the ones that Marco <laughs> Belgiumili ran. Yeah, but, but, you know, but, but, uh, but I mean, it's, yeah, but it's true. At the time, you know, <laughs> with, with Pioneer, it was the first trial, uh, uh, and it, with, with a no act. And so uh, I do believe that uh, there was also that uh, aspect that uh, the sponsor of the studies were maybe pushing for the 2.5 milligram dose, uh, which just created so much confusion in the context of, a, of, a, of an AFib uh, trial. I just wish that that arm was never there. Uh, then we got to Redool, and if you may recall, Redool started Starting overly stop, yeah. Uh, ambitious. I think the 8, original was 8,000. 8, I recall saying this is never going to happen. Uh, so it's, it's not for lack of, of, of effort, uh, but, um, but I think Augustus, I, they really got it right. I mean, I think Augustus got it. So, I mean, they just, they nailed it. They, re, you know, and again, they were lucky to some degree. I think you were saying something on Twitter or something. And again, they, you know, they, they, they were lucky that there was no interaction, right? Because when you have a factorial design trial, no, everything, gets, everything gets everything gets a mess yeah. if, if there's an interaction between the two treatments. Fortunately, there was not, so they could analyze the two the two randomizations independently and, and give us independent and definitely insights. Definitely, they uh, really uh, addressed the real question because from the previous trial, we were not 100% sure that it was the NOAC versus VKA right. or the double versus the triple. Right. So now we know that uh, NOAC both. is for sure better than VKA, and double uh, versus triple is also quite well defined. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, to me, that was the best, you know, the best part of it, is it really, it nailed that piece, uh, which, which, you know, which we didn't know before. Yeah. So let's hear from Dr. Han. What are you doing in, in here in Korea? Uh, after the introduction of NOAC, uh, many uh, interventionists uh, are uh, not reluctant to uh, use a NOAC uh, plus DAPT for a short period, and then after that, uh, we drop uh, aspirin, typical aspirin, and then we continue uh, clopidogrel plus NOAC in AFib and uh, PCI. But uh, Augustus trial is an excellent trial, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, aspirin was allowed uh, typically for one, one week, and a substantial portion of patients uh, did not undergo PCI. So as an intervention cardiologist, uh, um, I'm a little bit uh, concerned about the uh, aspirin dropping immediately after the PCI. So I typically use uh, aspirin for one month after the oh. index procedure. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, PTRI-12 inhibitor clopidogrel uh, plus NOAC. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a common, I mean, even though you, you said, I mean, our, our U.S. guidelines say drop the aspirin. In the United States, it is a very common strategy to give a month yeah. of, of, of aspirin, uh, you know, with with uh, uh, both a NOAC and a, a, a P2Y12. I mean, but I do think it's. I mean, it's important to recognize. I mean, if you look at some of the data, you look at uh, uh, the data from West or you I mean, all these trials. The bleeding rate in the first month on triple therapy is pretty high. I mean, it's. I mean, it is not negligible in that first mm -hmm. month. And so, even a month of aspirin is not is is prob. You know, I would like not to give a month of aspirin to these patients if I can. Okay, great. Well, this has been a, a, a great discussion. We are uh, uh, running out of time, but uh, I think we've, we've learned a lot. 
at the session earlier today. Uh, the good news is that uh, we're in business in this field for uh, for for a long time. A lot of uh, questions that remain uh, uh, unanswered, uh, but fortunately, there's a lot of effort being put in in, in the field. So it was great uh, having the opportunity to uh, uh, to speak with you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.